All right, morning. Uh, my name is David Soren. I'm the lead pastor here at Renovation Church. Uh, I actually just want to uh, second what Patrick just said in announcements. Our youth group has had just explosive growth. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, God's doing cool stuff. Our two youth pastors, Will and Lydia, have, have done amazing, amazing work. And we're having tons of students actually come to Christ uh, at youth group, which is really, really cool. So we're looking for people. I'm talking like real live people sitting in this room right now who are saying, I want to be used by God to disciple and do some amazing things. And honestly, the same with discipling adults here uh, by signing up for our follow-up team. Listen, I've, I've mentioned this the last couple of weeks, and it just keeps, the number just keeps growing. We've had 79 adults accept Christ in the last 12 weeks at this church. That's cool. And so we need people. People who will say, I don't want to do cruise ship Christianity anymore and just sip on my coffee while I listen to a message at Renovation Church while near revival is happening in the seats around me. I want to be used by God. And there are, we're having so many people come to Christ, young people, old people, everybody in between, that we need people who are going to say, I, I want to disciple someone one-on-one. That's what we do. We mentor, disciple people one-on-one. So you can sign up to do that at the table for youth group. You can sign up uh, on, a, on a card or, or, I don't think there are cards. I don't know why I just said a card. It's third service. You can go out to the lobby or on your app and talk to them and say, I want to join the follow-up team and, and disciple people. But the reality is there are a ton of ways that you can be used significantly Uh, by God. Okay, uh, let's open up the Bible together. So go ahead and uh, grab a Bible. If you brought your own, we're in Proverbs 4. If you're using the one at church, uh, we're going to be on page 434. Uh, We are in a series called Ways of the Wise, where we are doing what we typically do here at Renovation Church. We just teach uh, right through the Bible so you can understand it. Uh, We are currently in the book of Proverbs, uh, and we are actually kind of leapfrogging a little bit this week. We're going to chapter four, and then next week I'm actually going to come back to the end of chapter three because that's such a great passage uh, for some cool things that are happening in our church uh, next week. So today we're in chapter four, so you just find the big number four on 434 because we're starting right at the beginning of that chapter. Okay. Here's what the Bible says. It says, listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Okay. Now, actually, the majority of these first nine verses of chapter four are pretty similar uh, to what we've already covered in the first three chapters of Proverbs. Really, they can be summed up by that great verse seven. Did you see that verse seven? It says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. So if you want to walk in the ways of the wise, you actually have to get out off of your chair and get out and pursue wisdom. You got to do the four things we talked about two weeks ago. Do you remember this? You got to read scripture every day. You got to be reading, or at least listening to other books. You want to seek the Lord, ask God for wisdom, and you want to seek out wise Christians so they're speaking wisdom into your life. How are you doing with this? Are you making progress? I pray that you are, because Renovation Church, we want to be a people, as the book of James says, that aren't just hearers of the word, we want to be doers of the word. Okay, let's keep reading. So we're in verse 10 now of chapter four. It says, listen, my son, accept what I say and the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way, for they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter to the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like a deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Okay, so in this second section of Proverbs 4, uh, what I see really is two different paths 
that Solomon is describing here. Let me show you how my mind sees it. Okay, this is how I see it. So on, on the left of this diagram, we see the path of the, yes, I brought a laser pointer. It's just fine. Don't mock me. Um, <laughs> We see the path of the wicked, okay? And here's what the Bible says about the path of the wicked in Proverbs 4. It says, those on this path develop an addiction to evil. That's verse 16, okay? It says, they can't even rest until they engage in sin. And then verse 17, we, we see that they begin to find their identity in sin. That's what it means when it says, like, they just eat sin. They drink sin. Their whole life and identity becomes about sin. And eventually, verse 19 tells us that this path, as you can lead on the screen, see on the screen, it just leads to a deeper and deeper darkness. And it says, eventually, you just begin to stumble and pain, and shame, and all that comes as you get deep into the darkness, as you progress on the path of wickedness. Now, what I don't want you to do is kind of just absolve yourself from this discussion and say, oh, I'm not on the path of the wicked. The way the Bible teaches is that, honestly, we face choices all day long. Are you going to choose sin, the path of the wicked, or are you going to choose holiness, the path of the righteous? And one of the tricks is the, the, the path of the wicked, and we actually drew it this way, it looks more appealing in the beginning. It actually looks a little wider, a little bit more like, ah, I think I'll go down this path. And that's often how sin works, right? When you, okay, think about the choices you face every day. Is it easier to stay mad or forgive someone? Stay mad, right? Is it easier to lust or look away, right? Is, is it easier to gossip or to keep a secret? And so the path of the wicked lots of times actually looks more appealing to us in the beginning. It reminds me, there's a great verse in Proverbs chapter 14 uh, that says this. It says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Okay, and this is often how things work when you choose sin. It looks okay at first. That's why you chose it, right? But then eventually you get around the bend a little bit and the darkness starts to come. And so that's why you want to trust the word of God. And it even looks kind of wider in the beginning. You notice that? This is from the teaching of Jesus even. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, let me show you Matthew chapter 7. Jesus Christ says this. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. So it's saying, if you live like this, you live for Christ, guess what? Most other people in the culture are not going to be doing that. But it is what it is. It is the narrow road. But it is the narrow road that's the good road. That's the path of the righteous. So let's talk about the path of the righteous. Uh, we see, verse 11, it is a straight path. Now, that doesn't mean it's easy, but it means that it's good. It's not confusing to make the right choice. It's not messy. It's a path, verse 12 says, where you can even run. Run free, not with the, the burden of sin on you, and you don't need to stumble, in part because verse 18 is really helpful here. It says that this path, the more you progress, the deeper you go in God, the path shines in ever brightness, ever increasing. It just gets better and better and better, and you actually get to enjoy more of the blessings of the wisdom of God. But if, on the other hand, you continually choose sin and laziness, and bitterness, and selfishness, you will lead yourself into a deeper and deeper darkness. I think of it this way. I was reading a, a sermon not that long ago from Timothy Keller, and in it, he uh, mentioned an interview that he once read of uh, a, a guy that was actually in prison, and the prisoner was telling his life story, and he said, you know, when I was a young boy, uh, my father had this gold watch that he just adored. And, and the prisoner said, one day as a young boy, I went into his room and I took it out of the drawer and I started playing with it and I accidentally dropped it and it cracked. And he said, so I had to decide what am I gonna do? And he decided in that moment, he picked up the watch, put it back in the drawer, closed the drawer and walked away. Well, not that long after that, the father found the watch, called the family meeting. You ever have these in your house? <laughs> he called the family meeting and he said, who did this? Fess up. And the young boy kept silent when he said nothing. Years later, when he was an adult, I was telling this story from prison, he said one night he was driving, and he was driving on a, a really dark road, and he accidentally hit a kid with his car. Now, you know there's a decision to make when that happens, right? Are you going to go? Are you going to stop? Are you going to give CPR? Are you going to call 911? Are you going to call an ambulance? What are you going to do? And he said, I thought about it for a second, and I 
kept driving. And because no one was there to help the boy, he died. And eventually they found the man who hit him, and that's why he was in prison for a really long time. And in this interview from prison, he said this. He said, I feel like my life started to really go downhill, not when I hit the boy, but when I didn't confess to breaking the watch. Because listen, it is your character that matters. Your character, and thus how you will react in different situations, is shaped by a million little decisions along the way. So by the time he gets to the point where he hits the boy with a car, he's already made a million smaller decisions like that. They're going to influence the decision that he makes. And we're making decisions like that right now. Our young people are making decisions like that right now, even at a really early age. And so parents, I know we have a gazillion parents at this church, how many grandparents, but parents, the absolute best thing that you can do for your kid's future is to invest their time in the things that will have the biggest impact on their life. I'm talking ages zero to 90, okay? But most parents don't do that. Actually, what we end up doing is we don't do a lot of strategic parenting. We end up just kind of drifting along with the current culture. And you know, if you do that in America, and you kind of just drift along, especially with suburban culture, I can almost guarantee you that you will end up almost accidentally spending the vast amount of their childhood doing what you maybe never set out to do when they were two years old, and you'll spend most of your time trying to ensure that they make the varsity soccer team, or AAU basketball, or honors band, or the lead in a musical. Check out this data. Even the average American child, the average American child is now spending somewhere between 5,000 to 10,000 hours before they turn 18 on sports. An activity. Listen, I love sports. 10,000 hours. For what? What's the goal? When they ask a lot of parents, parents can't even ask, answer that question. Or a lot of them will say, so that they can keep up? So what? So that they can one day play varsity sports. For what? That's what? One, maybe two years of their life? Parents, that's 3% of their life. What about the rest of their life? And so mom, dad, I urge you, sit down together, even tonight, and talk intentionally, think strategically, how are we going to parent our kids so that we can strategically prepare them for their entire life? Not just sports junior and senior year of high school. Because what you really want to put the most amount of time into is to shaping their godly character. You want to read, especially if you have younger ones, you want to read the Bible to them every day. You want to teach them, this is a huge principle, you want to teach them to seek first the kingdom of God as Jesus teaches us. So that when anything else comes up against sports or activities, God wins. Because they're going to need that principle later on in life when they're in their 20s when they're in their 30s, you want to disciple them yourselves. You want to model for them what a relationship with Jesus looks like. Because if you're teaching them how to make wise and godly decisions, that pays huge dividends, way beyond sports in junior and senior year. It's huge dividends for the rest of their life, for decades to come. And so listen to me. Okay, this is a very hard word, but I just I have to say this to you because I'm not sure who else is going to say this to you. If, heaven forbid, when they, your kid turns 40 someday, or 45, if their marriage is falling apart, and their own kid is rebelling, and they just lost their, lost their job, parents, you need to know in that moment, they're not going to care that they were once on the varsity swim team. What they are going to be absolutely desperate for is the wisdom, presence, and direction of God. That is what they need for their life. And so you've got to make a decision now to even go home and reprioritize. Yes, this is good, this is fun, but it is not core. And it is not the best thing you can give them. You want to sit down as a parent and say, oh, I've got such a short time with them. I want to do whatever I can to bless them on the path of righteousness because that is what is going to bring so much blessing to them for the decades to come.
And we ourselves need to stay on the path of the righteous. And it's harder than it sounds. And that's why Solomon talks about that in the third section. So let's, let's go to verse 20 now. Okay, verse 20. He says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. And so in the middle of the chapter, in the second section, Solomon's just saying, watch out for the path of the wicked. Get on the path of the righteous. And now we see him, see him pleading with his son to be diligent about staying on the path of the righteous, which is a whole different thing, right? Look at, about, look at how serious he is about even the smallest of choices here. So he says this, verse 20, pay attention. Verse 21, don't let wisdom out of your sight. And then he says, guard your heart, watch your mouth, fix your, this is as close as we get to head and shoulders, knees and toes in the Bible, okay? He says, guard your heart, watch your mouth, fix your eyes ahead, give careful thought to your past. Don't turn to the right or to the left. What is he saying? He doesn't want his son to even take one step off the path of the righteous because he knows the deceptive appeal of the path of the wicked and the darkness that it will eventually bring to his child's life. That's why it just says, fix your eyes ahead. Don't tempt yourself. Don't look to the right or the left. Essentially, we should live our lives with blinders on, okay? Kind of like the horse. We're just saying, I don't want, I don't, I'm not even gonna look. I don't wanna know. It's too tempting. But look at how Paul writes in Ephesians 5. We don't think like this anymore. He says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. Now, if I can be honest, as I look at this list, I don't think we're actually very good at this as modern day American Christians. I think our grandparents are pretty good at this. As I've traveled around the world to places like Africa, I think many African Christians are actually pretty good at this. But modern day American Christians, we, we are often quite careless about what we let into our heart, about what we say, right? About what we watch. I mean, we're, all the blinders are off. And as a result of our carelessness, our, our lack of attention to the righteous path, our walks with God for a lot of us, they kind of feel stalled. Or, or, or stuck, right? Maybe they feel lacking to you. And I would say for many of you, it's simply because you've allowed yourself to just get about here, to surrender not all of your life to God, but about 20%. And we kind of do some Christian things, but we keep the other 80% to ourselves. And what happens is that doesn't get you very far down this path, right? And it's when you get farther down the path that wisdom really starts to work in such a way that it begins to just bless you with God's goodness. And wisdom starts to work. That's when you get the ever-brightening light of day. But the path won't work for you until you actually walk it. And the wisdom of God works because it is a cumulative effect of thousands of little decisions. I heard it said this way once, I can't remember who said this, but I think this is really helpful, is the path you are on determines the destination you arrive at. And so you have to ask yourself, where do I want to be uh, in 12 months? Uh, where do you want to be in five years? To the young people in the room, where do you want to be in 10 or 15 years? And if that's where you want to be, then what are the little decisions that you have to make even now so you can be there? And those choices, they don't always have to be about the big vices, you know, sex and drugs and language and everything else, right? And maybe, that's, maybe that is something for you and, and take that seriously, but lots of times it's even about the little things. I, I think of it this way. When I, was, uh, when I was in seminary, I had to do a rotation in uh, an assisted living center and uh, essentially, once or twice a week, kind of like a chaplain, I would go to the assisted living center, I was maybe 23 or 24, and I would just knock on different rooms, and I would say, hi, uh, I I'm, I'm from the seminary, you know, would you, would you like to chat? 
And as I went from room to room and I spoke with all sorts of different people in the final years of their life, I was just blown away. Because here's what happened. I'd go into the first room and I would meet some lady who was probably the nicest person I ever met. And she'd say, oh, dearie, you know, come, come in. Oh, I'm so happy you're here. Would you like some tea, right? And it would be so wonderful. We'd have a great chat for 30 minutes, and I ignorantly went to the next room, like, oh, this is really fun. This is really easy. And I'd go into the next room, and I would meet the angriest person I'd ever met in my life. And I'd say, would you like to ch- Get out. I didn't ask for a visitor. And I'd you know, kind of go shaking into the third room, right? And it would, again, it was the nicest person this side of the Mississippi, and we'd have a great chat. I'd go, okay, this is not so bad. That was an anomaly. And I'd go into the fourth room, and somebody would throw something at me and get out. And I remember, I, I, I finished that little uh, rotation, and it was at that point in my life, I developed a theory I, I think about often, and I called it, at that point in my life, two types of old people. Uh, <laughs> And now that I'm getting older, that sounds crass and maybe inappropriate. But the idea was this. It's that as we grow, what happens is we do tend to grow into two very distinct types of people. And you can't notice it as much when you're in your teens or even in your 20s. But by the end of of our lives, it tends to be quite pronounced, right? Because what happens is this. The longer that you walk the path of the righteous and you trust God, and you submit all of your life to him, as we read last week, right? And, and, and you begin to submit yourself to God's word. You spend time with the sweetness of Jesus. And, and you spend time in the vine, as John 15 says. And the fruit of the spirit begins to grow in your life. Love and joy and peace and patience and all of these things. What happens is by the very end of your life, sometimes that can look astoundingly beautiful. And I bet you know some people like this. In the later stages of life, they just just look like Jesus because they've been walking deep along the path. But on the other hand, if you spend your whole life insisting that you're going to do what you want to do and you don't want to follow what God says in his word and you don't want to let God work on you and you don't even really want to work on yourself, right? And you're unwilling to listen to others over time, that's going to leave you more and more isolated because you're going to believe that everyone who disagrees with you, they're not for you. And if they're not for you, they can't be your friend. And pretty soon, you find out that you're 80 and you're angry and you're alone. And I just remember being so shocked at the massive disparity and difference between people at that stage of life. And so the question for every single person in this room is, If that's in general, not every time, but in general where it's going, which path do you want to be on? And if you're saying, I want to be on that, I want to be like that woman at 85. Listen, you can't just snap your fingers and get there. You get there from 10,000 little decisions along the way that shape your character. And plenty of mistakes, okay? You're not going to do it perfectly. Don't give up if you take a detour at 35. You just get back on. You get back on the path of the righteous. But it's the little decisions. It's the little things that lead to great things, even at work. Honestly, a lot of the people who get promoted and they advance, they do the little things. They act with integrity. They're trustworthy. They show up on time. They treat people with respect. Jesus says those who can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. It's being the type of Christian that's more serious than the rest of their friends about who they date, about what they let their eyes look at about what they let into their heart because you're trusting that those little decisions are shaping who you will become. And so I actually want to take a minute and I actually want to speak to the youth in the room. I know we have a bunch of 6th through 12th graders in this service and I just want to talk to you for a minute. I urge you, at this section of your life, as you continue to get older, to not even step one foot on the path of the wicked. And there will be temptations through middle school, through high school. Well, you'll be tempted more and more. You say, I, I, just want to, I just want to see what it's like. But when you begin walking on it, what happens is it just starts to suck you in. And the more you walk on it, the harder it is to get off. And so my, my young friends, trust your parents when they warn you about it. Because honestly, your parents, I don't know if you saw this in the text, your parents are like Solomon in verse 3 today when Solomon said, for I too was once a son. I know it may not seem like it because you look at your parents and they're just so old. (laughs) But they remember what it was like. 
And they're not telling you to avoid these things simply because they're bad or they're wrong in God's eyes, which they are, but they're also telling you to avoid that path because they love you. And what they want for you, more than anything else, is God's goodness and blessing for your life. And that is found on the path of the righteous. As Pastor John Piper says, the Bible is God's guidebook to joy. And that's what they want for your life. And that's why they're pointing you on the path of the righteous, okay? All right, let me just speak uh, to the new believers in the room. I know there are a ton of you, of 80 just in the last uh, 12 weeks. Uh, So many of you are coming back to God in this church, which is really cool. Uh, Hundreds of you have given your life to Christ here in the last couple of years. And right now, many of you, you're very passionate about Jesus. I remember what that was like. And you're very excited. You can't even imagine going back towards the path of the wicked. But I just want to tell you, as someone who came to Christ as a young adult, uh, eventually that path will call out again. And it will lie to you. And it will say, you remember the fun times we used to have? And it's in that moment that you have to theologically, biblically remember who you are now in Christ. You are no longer chained to the path of the wicked, powerless over sin. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And so in that moment, when it comes and it says, you remember, you say, you shut your mouth. I I have God inside of me, Holy Spirit, free me, bring me back to the path of the righteous, and God will deliver you. But you got to call on him. You can't do it by yourself anymore, okay? And finally, uh, let me speak to those of you who have been walking with Christ for a long time. Some of you decades even, which is amazing. I want to encourage you with a verse. Galatians 6, 9, it says this. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And so if you're in that spot and you feel like, honestly, Pastor David, I'm, I'm 25% on the path and the last couple of years I've kind of stalled. I am just urging you, trust in the word of God and go deeper. Surrender more. Walk deeper in his wisdom. The blessing of his wisdom is coming. I just trust his path, Okay. All right, let me pray. God, thank you so much uh, for Proverbs 4 and all the, the wisdom that you put in there for us of the two paths. God, give us the courage to choose widely, even when that path of the wicked looks so appealing to us in the beginning. May we trust the wisdom of your word and choose the narrow path. And thank you that you bless the narrow path. You didn't even have to do that, but you do. And your ways are so good, and we're grateful for that, and we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.